Welcome to the Wolf Den, everybody. This is Dan David coming back at you. We have a very special guest today, General Paul Kern. We are joined in the Wolf Pack with, of course, Sound Carl. That's his, right. His <laughs> moniker, Sound Carl. <laughs> Andrew, the almost Carl. He'll, he'll get there someday. Yeah, someday. <laughs> and of course, Tick, our sound guy, because Carl's really not. All right. General Kern graduated from West Point in 1967 with a bachelor's degree in science. He holds a master's degree in civil engineering, mechanical engineering from, that's right, the University of Michigan. Right. <laughs> Sitting right above Ohio State, always. <laughs> always. Go and blue. Was elect <laughs> Go blue. And was elected to the National Academy of Engineering in 2006. He was a National Security Fellow at the JFK School. Harvard University and was a member of the Defense Science Board for 15 years. My old job. General Kern began his military career commanding operational units as a platoon leader and troop commander of the Black Horse Regiment in Vietnam, receiving a Silver Star, third highest meritorious award for valor. Five Bronze Stars, I believe I read, which is <laughs> no small feat at all, and three Purple Hearts, which, as you know, you you actually have to endure pain for those. <laughs> you get shot. Uh, sometimes. He retired after 38 years in the U.S. Army as a commanding general of the Army Material Command. The command of more than 50,000 personnel has a worldwide responsibility for supply, maintenance, support. The Defense Department manages in the Army depot system and conducts research for all the ground and rotary wing equipment. He has a unique career which blends technical expertise, combat operations, program management, policy development, and an advisor to senior, senior political leaders. He currently serves as a senior counselor at the Cohen Group and serves on multiple advisory boards, including the U.S. Rare Earth LLC. We should talk about that. Yeah. And a company focused on developing domestic supplies and strategic materials. General Kern, welcome to the show. Thank you. I look forward to the discussion. Yeah. Though, so look, I... The way we generally do this is a little background, and your background is so rich to the extent that you, what you could discuss, uh, what brought you to the Army, what, what enticed you to stay in for so long and achieve the highest level of command, uh, and what was interesting about that for a few minutes, and then, you know, current events about Ukraine and supply chain. Sure. Well, I grew up in New Jersey, not too far from West Point, though I had never even looked at the place until I actually was in my senior year and getting ready to figure out where to go to college. Uh, I ended up in my four years at West Point being very much focused on an Army career, um, which candidly I wasn't when I entered. I was thinking about playing football, but at 5'9", 155 pounds, didn't quite make the team that I thought I might. Ended yeah. up playing rugby instead. But in any case, uh, that inspired me to to stay in and uh, have a long Army career. I think the, the people I worked with and dealing with soldiers is something that is inspiring to, could be to every American. You get to meet people from all over the country, um, all different groups, but they get focused on on helping each other and conducting the missions for which they're assigned. I have an, an unusual career, as you laid out, and I bounce back and forth between operational assignments, program management, and dealing with the political leadership and policy development in the Secretary of Defense's office. So the, my career was uh, unique in that way, uh, but one for which I am very thankful, and, and it just opened up a lot of ideas and made a lot of great friends for me over my life. Oh, I bet. And I have brothers and sisters that... Uh truly feel that way, I'm sure, about some of them. Absolutely. I met my wife at an Army-Navy game as a blind date. And that was oh, 51, really? 51 years ago. So, uh, Congratulations. Who was she rooting for, Army or Navy? She obviously was rooting for Army. Oh, <laughs> Navy <laughs> doesn't even come close. <laughs> uh, who did they have? Napoleon Callum? He was good, right? That's, I think that's yeah, last well, I went there. Idea. They had this guy named Roger Staubach. As, as a, I've heard of him. And, uh, yeah. and we had a guy named Roly Stitchway, which pound for pound, pass for pass, run for run, was a equal to Roger on that football field in Philadelphia. Wow. Well, I'll tell you, Roger Staubach and Roger back then, they completed service before they, uh, they were eligible right. for the draft. You didn't get any of this uh, deferment stuff so you could go become an automatic millionaire. And Roger's done very, very well for himself. Yes, he has. Uh, and he's uh, helped the services, all of them, not just the Navy. Unsurprising. Unsurprising. Uh, so what did you find most challenging in your career? Was it the logistical side? Uh, 
was it was it actually combat or was it the the mortal combat of dealing with politics? <laughs> um, fortunately, it was all of the above, but not all at the same time. Yeah, yeah, and, that's a war on three fronts. Yeah, that's right. I mean, I will just tell you the uh, the North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong were a formidable enemy. I can't say that's the same for the Iraqis, but every time you're in, in a in a war, you, know, you have to fight the enemy every day, every minute, and so you get very focused on on that and making sure that you're on the winning side. That is our objective to win every day, every day. Yeah. So you bring up something very interesting: um, the different mindset between the Viet Cong and Vietnam and the Iraqi soldier and how one was committed to losing their lives for their country, politics aside, and the, and the other soldier wasn't. Did you see, did you develop any kind of opinion as to why that was? Well, I think there's two parts to it. I mean, we could spend hours talking about the Vietnam War and the good and the bad of it and, and how that is, but, but clearly they were committed to s developing their country as they saw it, uh, which was connecting the North and the South, and to fight it, as you pointed out, to the death, to the end. The Iraqis were living under uh, Saddam Hussein, who did not exactly inspire uh, great leadership. And he imposed his will on people through, I would say, some rather sadistic methods, uh, for which he ended up paying his ultimate price. But the, the soldiers were not terribly well-trained, not terribly well-led, and not, in my view, uh, concerned about the outcome. Right. You know, it was it was interesting, and I have a background in the Middle East, and, and, and uh, my father was actually born in Baghdad as an Assyrian Christian, so mm -hmm. wasn't very welcome there from, from birth. Uh, but, you know, he, he definitely, and my grandfather had an opinion about, about that. And early on, my grandfather said, they don't, they don't want democracy. They just want... A, a, a dictator they like, <laughs> you know, I mean, you can't, I've said this on the show before, you can't give democracy to a country. If, who gave it to us? Nobody. We fought for it. We bled for it. We died for it. We appreciate it. When you go topple a dictator and you just say, here's democracy, they're like, what's this? It means nothing. And it's a very difficult thing. Yeah, I think that's a, a true statement. I would also say that we don't particularly understand tribes. Right. It's uh, very tribal, and very tribal. still to this day. And, and how they work together to form leadership and government at a local level. And they don't necessarily respect a, or have any need for a, a, a federalized government, a centralized government. Very true. So when you add that on top of your, your points, I think it, uh, we, we just have a hard time understanding that type of a, of a leadership and a country's desires as to what they want to be in. Yeah, I, I mean, the, the tribal mentality of the Middle East, I mean, Gertrude Bell comes in and draws lines and says, this is a country, you know, uh, basically for the colonial times with the French and the English and a lot of those tribes. I mean, the only time they, they have any national pride is during a soccer game. Uh, other than that, it's about their family, their religion, whether they're Shia or, or Sunni, and um, there really isn't a kind of national pride, I thought, and been told. Well. I think we, we see that multiple times. We've seen it in Syria now. We've seen it in the Iranians. We've seen it in Egypt. We've seen it in different wars throughout the Middle East over many, many centuries. Do you think Iran is, is as tribal, or are they more, are they more connected through, through their religion, through their, them being Persian? They don't really consider themselves Arabs. They're not, right? So are they different in any way than the rest of the Middle East that you found? I think the answer to that is yes. They start out with number one, we're Persian. Right. <laughs> we refer to the Persian Gulf, and Saudi Arabia refers to it as the Arabian Gulf, and never the twain shall meet. Now, then you have Sunni versus Shia, uh, which is hard, I think, for us to understand because we see them both as Muslims. And then you bring in the some of the mistakes we've made in in the Middle East, as well as the the, the British and the French, mm -hmm. um, and you add that together in Iran. And today you have a, a dictatorship and a, and a very severe military ruler in two parts, one, one on the religious side, not on the military side, and secondly, on the, 
on the military when you separate their the Revolutionary Guards from the rest of the military, it's quite different. Yeah, I see them as a much more organized military machine than possibly any other, any Middle East country, including Saudi Arabia. But we'll, we'll see what happens there. I don't know that at the very end of the day that we're ever going to be able to stop um, a sectarian uh, conflict of some kind. How big it gets, I don't know. But they are going to have at it. And as we go in there, and, and try to separate the two, we're only ever seen as crusaders who never stopped crusading. That's probably a fair statement. So where we are now, looking at, and logistics plays such a large role in Ukraine and, and supply chain. And does it, does it surprise you at all, the resistance that the Ukrainians have put up against what was arguably a top three or two thought to be military in the in the world? I think it's surprising in in two primary venues. One is the failure of the Russians to live up to what we expected them to be able to do. And two, the will that has been shown under Zelensky's leadership in Ukraine to fight for their country. And that's a change that I think that took place after Russia walked in and took over the Crimea virtually unopposed. And then they created the separatist region in the Donbass area. So those two things were a wake-up call, I think, to the rest of Ukraine as to what Russia's intent was and how vulnerable they were. And, and clearly, uh, in the earlier wars around 2008, they got kicked hard, and Russia was able to wipe out a battalion in minutes, a battalion of Ukrainians. So between that time and, and 2022, they got serious about training, and their training with the help of NATO and U.S. made a huge difference in their capabilities that they have today. Clearly, they were outnumbered, they were out-equipped, but they absolutely did the absolute best that they could with the training that they had and the resources they had, and surprised, I think, Putin and the Russian army to no end. And you compound that with the mistakes that the Russians made, both logistically and leadership, um, you found that Ukraine was able to hold them off at this point for 130 some odd days. Yeah, they're losing terrain and they're losing a lot of people. The death rate, I think, is somewhere around for Ukraine, 200 a day, which is- 200 happens. a day, wow. And then the statistics are hard to exactly come by, mm -hmm. but I've heard that number quoted more recently. Russia's losing a third of its army from an equipment standpoint. And they're clearly showing that their leadership, just by the number of general officers they've had killed, as something that is lacking. They are in some ways compared to still fighting World War I and World War II tactics and have not made it into the 21st century, though their electronic warfare, I will tell you, is very good. And their ability to use massed artillery, which they've always done, yeah. continues to be very good. So it's a, uh, a surprise in the extent that the, I think that Ukraine surprised the Russians about how tenuous they were or how lack of tenuous, tenuously they were in terms of holding off Russia. They went at them, and they, they stopped them cold on their march to Kiev. Yeah, I, and the, the tactics, I mean, they've got these modern tanks, right? They've got the T-90s, the T-72s, and they've got uh, what the T-14, I guess, is coming out this year, next year, supposedly. Maybe. If they can afford it, yeah. And it's surprising how ineffective these have been when... This is largely a land war with a neighbor this is where you think this is kind of in the, the wheelhouse of a tank to handle. Now, you have a lot of experience with, with tanks and that kind of warfare. W what do you see happening there? What, what is the mistake they're making? Well, I think there's three tactics, leadership, and, and logistics. Well, gee, um, just those three. <laughs> and the, on the tactical side, a tank doesn't fight by itself. It's part of a combined arms team. So we combine infantry, artillery, and air to, to make a tank successful. The Russians mm -hmm. failed to do that. Uh, they mm -hmm. sent the tanks in effectively blind, and they got whacked. They went in on a, on a terrain that they should have known every square inch of and stuck to roads in a period in which you had minimal trafficability off the roads with no support out. And then they put a logistics train behind that, which couldn't get to refuel or rearm or or feed even the forces that were fighting in front of them. So they just, they had it very poorly planned from a tactical standpoint. 
And then when that all failed, their leadership failed, as opposed to soldiers in the U.S. in particular, but in the Western nations as well. We rely on our NCOs and the idea of, of intent, not just do it this way, step by step, lockstep. Um, Russia's, and then we've showed them how to develop those leadership in the 90s, and they just ignored it. So our, our non-commissioned officers, our young soldiers know how to take initiative. They know what the intent of the order is, and, and they use their initiative to be able to fight through systems like that. That's not what happened at all with Russia. Yeah, I, I wonder how that's going to evolve. You know, evolving things quickly is, is not their forte, but we've all seen these long 100-mile columns on roads, right, just lined up. And it's just entered my mind several times. What would, what would a squadron of A-10 Warhawks do to that column if they had it? I mean, they, they would annihilate it. Yeah, you put the, the Warthog, the Apaches, just shooting ducks. And Ukraine has none of that. No. And we all looked at that, and we just said, you know, if we had taken our forces against it, they would have completely obliterated that force, much like we did in Iraq. Yeah. I mean, I think people thought this was going to kind of going to go the same way, right? You're just, you know, you'll be in Baghdad as fast as your tanks can move. Nothing's going to stop you. And that's pretty much what happened. But here, it was a totally different situation. As, as you pointed out, the tactics were just all off. And this wasn't, you know, a far-flung mission. Right, it's your it's your neighbor next door. You should like you like you said. You should have known every inch of square ground there, and they didn't. They haven't even closed the skies. Do you have an opinion about how they're not able to just completely dominate the skies over Ukraine? Well, I think there's a couple of factors that, and, and I'm I'm just saying it from my observation, so I don't have any inside information on it specifically. But number one, Ukrainian Air Force pilots have been absolutely outstanding. They have demonstrated that. They have the ability to outfly aircraft, which are far more capable than that. And so they, they, they do it at night, so they take away the, the daylight observation. They do it in very distributed ways to keep from being hit on the ground before they can take off. And they do it very, very effectively. Um, and so if you go out to any of our red flag operations or anything where we teach our pilots how to fly in a tactical one-on-one -on -one or many-on-many -many type of operations. Uh, Ukrainians took that to heart, and they're demonstrating how effective a, a pilot can be. It's not just about the machine. I would say, secondly, the, the new Russian aircraft aren't as good as they had laid out them to be. And we're seeing their demonstrations of their capability, the Su-7s, they just aren't performing the way they expected. And I think, uh, you know, we push our F-35s, our F-22s to the limit, and and but you don't kid ourselves when things aren't working the way they're supposed to. I think the Russians did a lot of, I will say, covering up some of the issues that the aircraft actually had. I'm now wondering about all of it, right? The T the T-14 Armada, which is supposed to be the the tank of the future. Uh, I'm I'm wondering that tank, you know, has broken down in the middle of their parades too. <laughs> no, I didn't know that. No, that that does not inspire confidence. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good reason not to have a parade. Wow. Back to the flying part of it. It, it just, it seems like it's a total failure on the intelligence side for Russia, not to know where these planes are grounded and to be able to attack them during the day as they sit. How, how do you think the Russians could not infiltrate to the degree to understand? I mean, because these planes have to go somewhere, right? They have to be somewhere and they're vulnerable. And they don't seem to be attacking them when they're on the ground. Well, I want to encourage them to, number one, because we are putting out air defenses over there, mm. and they've gotten a lot of the, some of their own equipment. The, the former Soviet and now Russian equipment has been given to them by the NATO, new NATO nation countries, which have come over to join the West. So one, I think they know the capability of their own air defenses, and that has them concerned. And then we've added on top of that the handheld systems that, are, that we've provided and so we've distributed air defenses pretty well around that country. And it's, it's not it's a big country. And so they have the capability to disperse the aircraft, and they've done that very well. I think what's amazing is that clearly uh, Russia has always been known for its intelligence capability. And they have not demonstrated that they're using it very effectively. It's, I don't think it's that they don't have it. It's how they're using it. Or do you think there's a 
they're purposely not using it to sandbag Putin? No, I don't think so. But I think that Putin, I mean, he is an intel officer from day one. And so if he could be sandbagged, I would be very surprised. Number two, I think that he has the ability to, to really direct the way people use the intelligence capability, which he has done. But that in turn goes back to the leadership side of it and how they actually implement that. And that seems to be the missing part. Well, do you think this ends in a stalemate or is there going to be a winning side? Yeah. Is there a breaking point for, for either Russia or Ukraine? I don't know if you've read anything that Ben Hodges, a former uh, U.S. Army commander in Europe, has written recently. And he says U Ukraine will win by the end of the year as long as we keep providing them the equipment and munitions that they need to keep fighting. I hope he's right. Me too. But I think the the ability, Russia has a lot more depth than Ukraine does, and they're fighting a war of attrition, that back to old siege warfare. And so the question is, how long can, can Ukraine hold out under those conditions? If somebody makes a mistake, it could go very quickly. As long as they keep slugging it out the way they are, it could go on for a long, long time. So I don't, my personal opinion is right now, I don't see an early end to this. And I, and I think that Ukraine uh, under Zelensky's leadership will continue to fight Russia for every square inch of Ukraine. Yeah, well, I, I think Russia losing this is, I mean, uh, Putin has to see this as life and death for him. He does. At least, at least politically. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Which, which I'm fine with. Although, be careful what we wish for, right? So yeah, you know, you that's know, true, because we don't know who comes next. Yeah, well, it's not going to be Gorbachev. Uh, no, he's, it's not. <laughs> he's comfortable right now back here. Yeah, there you go. Uh, so just taking the, the other side of the argument for a minute and understanding it. I, you know, I understand if you have to couch this, but I'm just making an observation. Over the last 20 years of the expansion of NATO and how important really was it for us to have Estonia and their 10,000 troops or Lithuania and their 20,000 troops. Uh, and symbolically for Russia, that's right on their border, right? And, and then all of these other member applications, you know, Georgia famously had their incursion and, and wants to be in, of course, Ukraine. Do you see the Russian side of it at all that this is, hey, maybe if you stopped at Poland, we wouldn't have this problem? I guess I could look at it from two days. One is the rate at which we did it, not necessarily the countries that you named. And I think we invited Russia to sit in on NATO. I'm not sure mm -hmm. if you're aware of that. So I am, yeah. Mm -hmm. They were sitting in the NATO headquarters, and we could never convince them. And perhaps just because they never wanted to believe this was not aimed at defeating Russia, but at creating democracies that could live on their own. So... Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia. People forget that Russia still maintains Kaliningrad, which yeah. sits right on their border right there. Right, right, so, seaport. So we end up with a, a very strange relationship. And, and this is the other place, I think, where, where Putin and Russia absolutely played the wrong game. They thought attacking Ukraine and Ukraine coming down quickly would be the end of NATO. And just the reverse has happened. It's brought right. NATO together. And so we've had forces up there in Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, with under Article 5, if Russia attacks, we will defend, mm -hmm. we being the U.S. and NATO. And more surprisingly, is Finland and Sweden's now joining NATO, though the rest of the Russian border way north. It's so a big deal. It, it's it a very a big, big deal. deal. It is a big deal. So I think Russia has really mismanaged that and the expectations from both the East and the West turned in a way that he would never never expected. I've spent a fair amount of time wandering around those countries in the 90s, um, and even more recently in 2000 in, in Bulgaria, and looking at their, those countries want to be independent. They want to have a capability to rule their own and to make their own decisions. And they know that under the old Soviet rule and under a Russian leadership, they won't be able to do that. So they are very much encouraged then uh, to be part of a strong economic organization, the EU, and to a strong military organization, NATO. And, and so as you look at that, I think I understand it from Russia's position on why they, what they thought was happening, which was wrong, 
versus what people actually wanted to do was to just be independent and absolutely have a cover against Russia if they decided, like they did right now in Ukraine and Georgia, to walk in. Yeah, it's it's now greatly expanding. It's, I would say this was a moment that, that has brought NATO together where pretty famously Germany was always kind of, you had their side, you had, you had the rest of NATO. And I do remember that that Russia early on, there was even talk of Russia becoming part of NATO at one point in the you know, early 2000s, late 90s. And I think there was some kind of famous like line where, you know, we don't apply to NATO. We get in, we're invited. I mean, well, you either tell us we're in or, 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 or we're not doing it. And it just kind of went away. Is that something you remember? Somewhere. There was inside the U.S. political establishment, there were arguments about how we deal with Russia. I can tell you um, when we were fighting in the Balkans, because remember, people kind of forget about that. So you go back to yeah. the early 90s, the, the Balkans were a mess. Yeah, and Bosnia, they under, Serbia. They were under UN leadership at that time, and it was failing. It took the U.S. to go to NATO and say, we need to stop this fighting, and we need to come together and support it. And so we had many, many meetings on doing that under Secretary Perry, uh, leadership, frankly. And he brought all that together at a meeting, and the NATO said, okay, we're going to go in. And we took the 1st Armored Division out of Germany and, and marched into Bosnia. First time NATO had operated out of sector. First time NATO had really crossed into the other side of the Alps to figure out how to fight. Mm -hmm. Learned a lot of things about, about dealing with that. And in the middle of all that, we said, what are we going to do about Russia? Because they're tied into the Serbs. We don't want them to now create a, a new battleground here. And so we had all sorts of discussions about how do we get uh, Russia to join as part of the NATO operations. And it was on a, in a ride out to Fort Riley, Kansas, with the head of the Russian army, uh, with the U.S. Secretary of Defense. And he said, and he said well, what is it that you really want to do? He said, we just want to be part of the U.S. operation. And so we put a, a Russian brigade under a U.S. command and to go into to the Bosnia-Herzegovina uh, operations and to deter them from then siding with the Serbs against it. And it worked. Not comfortably, but it worked. They were very late to the game. Uh, it was, uh, I mean, NATO was already in there. I, I remember them, I think Milosevic was almost done, if not captured or given up. No, it was before that. So they, they had tanks and they had actual uh, equipment on the ground? Uh, yes, they did. That? Wow. Yeah. That's what you get when you talk to a general who was there and get informed. Facts, well, that, maybe facts. <laughs> I mean, the, the point of all that, though, is that we were working very hard at that point in the, in the mid-90s to get Russia to see that we weren't just the bad guys aimed at destroying Russia, that they could work with us, create a, a military operation that would bring peace to a land that was just split. I mean, we had the fighting going on in Croatia, Bosnia, Serbia, Kosovo, Macedonia, and, and it was just destroying capability that people didn't need to. And, it, and we saw, obviously, some real atrocities that had taken place. Yeah, yeah, it, it, was, it was very, very bad. And back to where we are now, we have this Europe at war, really. I mean, mm -hmm. not all about Europe at war, but Europe at war. I think this, at the end of the day, either way benefits China, either with a weakened Russia, who they share a border with, an indebted Russia to them. China does not forget anything. So they're going to remember that there's a map 500 years old that says they, they own the South China Sea. They're going to remember that, that the Russians took a, quite a bit of land after World War II. And then if the Russians you know, really went in there and, and did what people thought and just rolled over Ukraine, that gives Europe something to think about, well, well China really gets what they want, which is Taiwan. How do you see this playing out from the China's mentality and, and Taiwan, which is you know still not a fate and complete? That's a uh, the right question to be asking. Number one, I mean clearly, China under Xi has written their 2050 plan, which says exactly what they want to do, and that's to dominate Asia and to be the world's economic leader. And they've been working very hard at that. One of the concerns we've always had is Russia and China working together, which we see right now that they are doing, at least they appear to be. 
And some could even say, to your point, that, that she would like to see Russia weaken through all this. That helps their northern boundary. It helps the Arctic uh, issues that they've dealt with. And it, it gives them a leg up in terms of how they can focus on the Pacific and the, and the West, uh, as opposed to having to deal with Russia. So I think this, in fact, is a favor to, to China. And it poses then the problem to us to go back to Taiwan's. So we always had the one China policy, but clearly more recently we we say yes, it's up to Taiwan to decide their fate, not up to the PRC. And so we will support Taiwan from that perspective, and we have said that we will maintain the freedom of the seas through the Taiwan Straits. Very recently in the discussions, if you saw yesterday with General Milley and the and the Chinese military leadership. There's a little jousting there in terms of how we would go about doing that. But the point was made, I think, on both sides that perhaps may be overlooked is what they both agreed to is we have to find a common way of talking to one another to prevent a military accident and to have a way of dispelling any ideas about what our intent is versus their intent. At the same time, Taiwan becomes a linchpin of, of how this all plays out. I don't think we see any move on either side, either the U.S. or China, to change our position. PRC wants Taiwan to be part of the PRC. Taiwan wants, to, at this point, to remain independent. And the U.S. respects that independence and says that we will support Taiwan. Yeah. Um, having said that, I, you know, she has been unlike any other character in China. Uh, you know, him coming to power, not many of the China-based employees I had or contacts or whatever thought that he would extend his power or be able to do that. He took over control of the military very, very quickly. That's usually something that happens towards the end of the first term, beginning of the second term for a Chinese presidency. He has complete power there. Uh, the one thing you can say about Xi is he says what he's going to do and he does what he says. And he says he's taking Taiwan. Uh, I don't know if that means tomorrow, next week, next year, but that is probably priority number one for him. And it doesn't seem like diplomacy is going to work. Taiwan just does not want to be, rightfully so, part of China. And I, I worry about our capabilities because you, you know, we all remember you know, 10, 12 years ago when they were building up these shoals and these rocks and they're, they're like, oh, these are just beaches. Of course, We'll never use them for military purposes, you know, wink, wink, and, and they have, and we haven't really called them on it, but they are pretty capable with, with those military establishments. I worry, I've talked to admirals, naval commanders, about the ability and the effectiveness of our flat tops um, near the South China Sea in proximity to China. They are not unsinkable. <laughs> you know, nobody off the record agrees that they are. I mean, they might say they're difficult. But they are not unsinkable, and you're talking about thousands and thousands of sailors going down. And what do you think? I mean, do you think if there's a kinetic conflict there, do we have the will to go over there and lose that many servicemen for Taiwan? That's a, uh, I guess, the million-dollar question or trillion-dollar question, as you might put it. Mm -hmm. I think there's two parts that you leave out of that, and that's the economics of Taiwan. Oh, yeah. Um, um, Taiwan Semiconductor. <laughs> right. We all depend on them. Yeah. And, and so if you destroy Taiwan in the battle, who wins? The world economy will suffer. And, and that, that's a factor. I think the Chinese and the, have looked at two things right now. They've got very strong economic ties to the U.S. and to Europe. And so they don't make money by selling to themselves. They make money by selling overseas. Right. Right. Consumerism is not, they want to get to that kind of economy. They don't right. have it. Right. And they're working on it, but they still have a huge, I mean, with over a billion people, they have a huge middle class and a huge upper class compared to the rest of the world, but they also have a huge group of people who are still impoverished. And, and so China has its own economic interests, at, which I think she puts as number one priority. And, and then so where does Taiwan fit in that is the question is, from my perspective anyway, is how they look at, at Taiwan. And as time goes on, uh, China has a demographic problem. They're aging. Their one-child policy has caught up with them, and so they've got a, they're going to have a lot of old people like me to take care of in the, 
in the future. And the future is, is starting now. I mean, it's not something that they have, they can turn around. So they have to deal with that. Uh, the second thing which I find interesting and that, that you didn't mention it is India. So India is the other billion plus country with a growing economy, ties to Russia, ties to the West, all sorts of interesting things. But for the first time, they've stood up to China on in the Hindu. And they have, in the mountains, forced China to back down for the first time. In the Hindu year. Kush, yeah. uh, famously where they beat each other to death yeah, the, bats. The, the stick fighting up in the right. mountains. That's that. Yeah. But that's never happened before. And that's got to be a wake-up call for, for China to be looking at the fact that India is not the pushover that they used to be either from a military standpoint, and they have a very strong economy, and they have a very young population. So whereas China has an aging population, India does not. And then you put this, this new group that's working together, which we refer to as the Quad, is India, Japan, Australia, and the United States. It's not an alliance. It's not a NATO. It's not the CEDO that used to be. But it's people who are banding together for their economic and security standpoint to say, these are the kind of things we're worried about China doing. So much like Russia caused NATO to come together, China has caused these four countries to say, we have a common problem, and it's China. And oh, by the way, NATO also picked up on that and has now included the Belt and Road Initiative as a challenge against NATO, not just against everything that they're doing in Ukraine with Russia. Well, welcome to the party. Uh, some of us said that for 10 years, that these, obviously, the, the Belt and Road Initiative, where they're making loans to third world countries in Africa that are significantly larger than five or six years of their GDP to build deep water ports, saying, hey, this will improve your economy. What happens? They default on the loan. What happens? China takes that deep water port and not that's now a military installation. They've done it on the east side of, of the African continent. Now they're doing it on the west side of the African continent. And that's all to leapfrog to South America and screw with us in our hemisphere. That is their strategy is to, I mean, in my opinion, that it's hard talking to a general because like, you know, uh, I know nothing compared to you, but I've seen their strategy in the Belt Road that, that swoops down through Africa over into South America, and and then they're in our hemisphere. Is that, that is that what you're seeing? Well, I see that's their intent, but I also see that they have treated these countries so poorly that they've really turned them against them politically, and mm. they've turned the populations against them. So they, they may have won a, a port, but they have not won the population. And, yeah. and so then you go back to looking at what's going on in places like Ukraine. You know, if the people believe in their own country's independence, they'll push back again. I just finished reading a book called Disunited Nations. I don't know if you've looked at it or not, which has a mm. very interesting geopolitical look at the world. And it deals precisely with, with China and its ports facilities and around the world and all of those areas. They're not as effective in that book anyway as they would like to be. Um, and so as you go through some of those things, you, you say, okay, if you are unkind to the people that you have just taken over their economic because ports are how people live today by shipping mm -hmm. goods mm -hmm. in and out. Is that the way you're really going to be able to sustain yourself for another century? Maybe the answer is yes, if you're strong enough and big enough and tough enough. But it's always going to, to me, leave the question of instability that's going to be out there for some time. But they're creating an opportunity at the same time they're creating some instabilities. Yeah, that sounds like our model of the 70s and 80s in Central America. And uh, <laughs> Oddly enough, China is 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 looking at you know the El Salvador's Guatemala's of the world as well, yeah. and I you know look I, I don't agree with that thesis that these ports are not all that effective, but we have to continue to remember that China has a five year plan that they put out. They have a ten year plan that they don't necessarily put out a fifteen, a twenty, and all the way up to two thousand fifty that they're talking about now. But they also have that plan for us. They, they, they plan out both scenarios. So they look at it on, on more of a long tail than we do. Yeah, having it and it not being effective or useful today does not mean it will not be effective and useful 10 years from now or 15 years from now. And that's why our political climate has to get much more cohesive and less divisive, because that's part of their plan. 
I'm a hundred percent with you on that. Yeah. I think the, the Chinese have a plan. They have a setback. They keep marching forward on their plan. And it's, it has been not dependent upon changing administrations. And as you pointed out, he has lasted a lot longer than anyone expected. So he has not only the ability to, to drive the plan, but he also wrote the plan. And so he has that going for him, whereas we change our leadership periodically, and we are so divisive right now, it's hard for us to look beyond two years, no less 25. General Kern, how do we solve that part? I mean, that you, you want to know the trillion dollar question? That's the trillion dollar question for us is how do we, how do we come together? I mean, we're starting to now see China in some ways uh, on both sides of the aisle as the adversary that they are, you know, both militarily and, and economically. It just changes over four or five years. We're now talking about rolling back tariffs. You know, and why, how could we ever get into a discussion about Huawei being a part of our critical 5G infrastructure? I mean, it's just, it's, it's ignorant to even have it in the discussion, but it is. How do we solve it? I, I wish I had a magic answer for you on that. The, yeah. uh, you know, I, I guess, you know, having spent a long part of my life in the Army and working in the government from that perspective, we argue about plans. And we, and we argue with different courses of action or work. Is it A, B, or C? And we, and we create a red force that will counter what our plans are, and we play that out. In the end, the decision is made as to the course of action that you're going to use. But we also plan on it, what we call branches and sequels. So if this doesn't happen, we'll do that. And so we'll, we don't just set a plan as this is the only way it's going to go. But we have a plan and we agree to it, whether we are the one who supported it or not. And whatever the leadership says we're going to do, we all line up behind him and say, yeah, verily, we're going to do that. As the, we also say is once you start in the fight, the enemy gets a vote. And then as soon as you cross the line of departure, life changes. And so I think you have to have a plan. You have to, whether you agree with it or not, but you accommodate change within that discussion. And that's my part that I find is missing. And then you say, so what do we need to do? We have to listen to both sides of the arguments. The right and the left are so far apart right now, they don't even come close to talking to each other. No. But what has been our strength in the past is the middle does. And so whether you're a conservative or a liberal, you find that there's good ideas on both sides. Economics drives most of it. And, and, and we don't have a strong military unless we have a strong economy. Right. So we have to have all of these things to come together. So the, the missing part to me is people listening to the other side and not just shutting off any idea that they have. That's got to change. And I don't see it happening right now. I've always been hopeful that it will. But I think the, the young people in this country will have a very different life than I grew up to deal with if we don't find that, that middle ground where we can accommodate the good ideas from both and set aside those things. Maybe that's plan B or plan C that we'll eventually get to it. Yeah, that's well said. Uh, I, I would say that Young people already have a much different life, much more entitled life. And any young person listening to that, if you don't like it, screw you. <laughs> but I, I would say one thing, too, is, is open primaries, really. I mean, I found in politics and, and being involved, and you just have to go so far right or so far left in a primary that's closed that it's hard to come back to the center for a general election, and you're just you're kind of pigeonholed in there. And a third party, which both parties have, have an interest and have been very, very good at blocking any kind of third party identity, like you know, independent means what? Nothing. Libertarian means, I don't know, you can drink Drano on the weekends, you don't care, whatever. But there's no <laughs> definition to it. 1% uh, of the vote, yeah. Yeah, you're going to get 1% of the vote. Yeah, you're going to get the, or you'll screw up you'll screw up somebody's election, like famously Ross Perot with George H.W. That's my two cents on, on those things. In the, in the immediate future, I hope we've learned, and you know, I think you've worked on, and you're working on supply chain issues here in the United States, rare earth minerals, which are vital to everything we use. And China has cornered the market, which they planned on doing back in the early 90s. They said, this is going to be our... Mm -hmm our thing. And it has been because they don't have something called the EPA and they just, they can just, you know, poison people. It's fine. But we, we have rare earth minerals here. 
Yes, we, we do. We just don't have the political will to get them out of the ground. How does that change? Yeah. Let me go back to your other discussion quickly, if I could. Okay, sure. I guess the one common thing I've heard people say that makes sense to me is term limits. Yeah, I agree. We don't have them. 100%. 100%. Yeah. We have a term limit for the president, but we don't for our Congress and we don't for our Supreme Court. Right. I, I do believe in term limits, yes. And I think that would cause people to say, hey, I can't do this forever. So we start making some accommodations. In any case, that, that if you're looking for a solution, that's the only one that I can really see right now, to me, that makes sense, that would help us. I don't know if it's secure, but it would, in my view, would help us. So now let me talk to rare earths. Now, rare earths aren't rare. They're all over. You go dig right. a hole in your backyard, you'll probably in the find backyard. It. Yeah, you would. Okay. And, and so the issue is, what do you do with it? Because it takes a lot of processing. So we just had a three-hour board meeting yesterday talking about it. On, and we have a mine in Texas called Roundtop. It's got all the rare earths and it's got lithium. And so we go through the economic analysis of what it takes to go through it. We also know, to your point, that China has cornered that market in the world today. And whether it's uh, the World Bank or somebody else can, has stopped them from unilaterally raising prices or lowering prices at cut times. But to me, what has really opened up people's eyes, ironically, is, is the whole COVID experience. Mm -hmm. And looking at supply chains from where do we get this stuff from? And so whether it's rare earths or whether it's semiconductors or whether it's glass for containers for our different biologics, it has awakened people to see how dependent we have become on materials around the world. There's another book or another story that was written in The Economist some years ago about containers that changed the world. And it's, it's interesting because everything today moves by container products moved by container, not rare earths. But that changed the world economy and created a lot of this independence because it became so much cheaper to move things around the world to find that the lowest labor for the best ability to get a product into a market. Now you go back to rare earths, can't put it in a container. And so we're limited to where do we get it from? And then whether it's China or Malaysia right now, those are the two big, big sources. And where do the mines come from? Right now, they're in Australia, Canada, the U.S., South Africa. Not pushed, only the U.S. <laughs> well, yeah. we've kind of pushed mining into the, to the dark ages, if you will. But we're looking at new processes for rare earths. We will do it all in the United States, and we'll do it with lithium as well. So the other part that we're looking at is we electrify batteries, et cetera. Right. And so it's here. What we also see is a disinformation campaign from China. And guess who they're going to go after and fund? All the people you just talked about. They don't have the EPA. And so when you see a lot of pushback against our capabilities, people really need to go back and ask the question, where did the money come from to do that? And, I'll, and I don't care if it's just rare earths, but that's clearly one of them. You will find China behind a lot of it. You will find right. Russia behind a lot of it. This whole internet uh, that we have created in the last 20 years. You know, ironically, I look at it and I grew up most of my life without an internet. Wasn't that wonderful? Yeah. And today, you know, you're, you're tethered to this little machine and the internet. Yeah. But it also, we said, well, it's going to allow people to educate around the world. That's true. People in the middle of Africa on a little iPhone can go to school and they don't have to have walls and things. They get the books right on it. They have their monetary change on it. So it did some really good things, but it also opened up this ability for anybody and everybody to talk to one another and not knowing whether it's true or whether it's biased or whether it's propaganda. And so we're fighting these two different aspects of the 21st century where people have to understand that not everything you read on the internet is true. And you can, and how do you verify things? At least as a school book, you used to be able to go back and everything was cited where it came from. Mm -hmm. Academics were very much focused on um, not plagiarizing other people's work and making sure that you have, a, if you have a scientific work, that you have a proof that your hypothesis can be traced to a solution. Things change over time as we get smarter and learn different things, but that's not on the internet today. And so we have this great propaganda machine out there that you just right. don't know how it is. And that is, to me, one of the challenges. And so as we get into these rare earths, we can produce them in the United States. We can do it much cleaner than the Chinese can do it. And we mm -hmm. can do it at, at costs that are going to be competitive with anything else in the world. And so we've got to, we've got to deal with it. And so we're looking at 
you know, our company, USA Rare Earths, is new to the scene, and so we're still in the infancy, but people ought to believe that it's a good, good thing to do. And I look at the others, whether it's Mountain Pass or Linus or these other companies that are producing Rare Earths, their processing is still in, in China or Malaysia. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. Yeah, they're, they're not, uh, Mountain Pass isn't, isn't helping us in any way. They're not really producing anything as vital yeah. as, as lithium anyway. And then China's their customer and they have a capital audience. So, you know, how do we do this and how do we do it? Hold on to this thought for the benefit of the United States. And as far as the different disinformation campaign, look, I'm a freedom of speech activist. That's, you know, that's what I think my job is, whatever anybody else wants to call me a short seller or whatever, I don't care. It's about freedom of speech. But when it comes to foreign political speech that is aimed at hurting the United States, holding us back, we have to be much better at identifying it, stopping it, or at least tagging it with some kind of notice that you can see. And we find all the money launderers, you know, when it comes to that, you know, Anybody cheating on taxes, we're going to find them. That's all good. But we can't seem to find where this disinformation comes from or where the money comes from that gets an EPA inspector on your ass or somebody else in government that's trying to get another $5,000 donation, whatever it is, to oppose our critical infrastructure. And rare earths are, you know, a, a top, top priority. You know, I hope all the listeners here can can get behind that. And hey, nothing against Mountain Pass as a stock, fine, whatever, buy it, don't buy it, I don't care. But understand that that is going to China. And I, I hope the companies that you're working with, General Kern, have the United States in mind and, and really just our allies where that's concerned. We do. And I've had that discussion. Do we look at it from an American standpoint, which would include North and South America? Do we look at it from just the U.S. standpoint? And and clearly, allies have to be a, a critical part of it. As I said, we've we've really lost our edge in mining, so we've got to learn from some people. The well, Africa, Australians, the Canadians do a better job at understanding all that, in my view. And as another part, and you deal with the financial world a great deal. So one of the things that we see in terms of how you finance these projects is. What we're doing is technically complicated. How you separate Earth and do it economically, and we found some good ways to do that so that you can create the lithium and the rare earths. And then how do you put that on a market? How do you process that? We found some new ways of doing that, which we think are going to be clean. We know they're cleaner and more economically beneficial. But then I go to the investment community, and it takes forever to explain all these different things that we're doing. And so I would hope that not only just America believes it, but the investors understand when we do our our analysis, it's thorough. We don't want to put money into something that's going to lose. We're going to put something in that's going to win for America and make money. What a unique idea. Well, I mean, I would think that you know BlackRock and Jeffrey Oven and all these other guys that are just ESG is everything, would put their money where their mouth is and see that, you know, this is ESG. And it's not everything that you're digging out of the ground is going to be great for the environment, but it's going to be much better than what we're dealing with now. They're ruining the environment in China, and they're controlling that supply chain to your phones, to our, our, you know, F-35s, you know, our tanks, our siding equipment. I mean, it just affects everything. So the social governance part of it is definitely there. And I'm, I'm not surprised you're having a hard time with financing, but like you definitely got to keep at it. Us more than anything, we if we're pulling it out of the ground, we're pulling it out cleaner than anybody else. You know, how we pull out our gases, how we pull out Earth because of the EPA. The regulations aren't always great, but at least there are those slight protections. I mean, the devastation that a lithium mine oversees, they have child slave labor, the environment is absolutely decimated around there. So if we're doing it with the EPA's guidance, I think we're doing it better. I think you're absolutely right. You know, I grew up in the automotive side of the world out at Michigan when the EPA was just putting in all of our clean air requirements. The auto companies, in my experience, would have never done that unless we had come up with some draconian changes that would have been made because it costs more. You know, and, and every penny that you put into producing an automobile becomes a cost that you can't recover. But we did it. We did it as a nation. And, and you can live in Los Angeles and New York City and 
the smog doesn't kill you every day. And and so as we we know that there are some really good things that can happen when people focus on that type of boat. mining. Uh, my wife used to work with the mining agencies and in dealing with safety in our mines. Our mines are better. Our processing is better. And so the the rules that we set up sometimes we get frustrated with, but in the end, we have a better life because of it. It's when they people twist it and go beyond that, that that's where we have the, the challenge. Political game. And yeah. I look at it from the standpoint of, uh, you know, making life better for Americans is really what our goal is and, and making money for the people who have to do it, whether you're working in the mine, whether you're working in a processing, working in a magnet facility, putting it all into a product, or whether it ends up in a and an F-35, or it ends up in your automobile, that all are things that we, we need to do. And, and again, I, I come back to this. We were not paying attention to supply chains until COVID hit. Right. And when all of a sudden we shut everything down, we all of a sudden realized we didn't have it. Well, where did it come from? We started asking those questions. And then we really started looking carefully at what China was doing on manipulating the supply chains. And, and so to me, we are in this economic competition, and I'll call it a competition, but you got to know the rules of the competition. And, and if people violate the rules, you got to call them on it. If we play by the rules and we win, and both sides have the opportunity, I mean, that, that's the fairness that we look for. That doesn't always happen. Clearly, we know that. But you have to understand that, and we have to, in my view, and people are beginning to do it, looking at supply chain as a critical part of how we are going to survive as a nation. Amen. Amen. Maybe we should. Maybe we could make friends with Venezuela since they have more oil than Saudi Arabia and more rare earths than China. It wasn't too long ago we did. I had an uncle who was a, a World War II Marine who worked for a company called Lock Joint Pipe. And guess what they were doing? Putting pipelines in Venezuela. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's there's a lot to be said for that. We can make friends and make peace with our enemies. I mean, look I at Vietnam. You can you can, right? you can only make peace with your enemies, right? That's why they call it peace. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, Vietnam. I mean, look. I mean, every I'm rooting for Vietnam like nobody's business. It's, their success is is taking from China. And look, they're they're a tough people. So let China try to go roll in on them. Yeah. That's not going to be easy. And the same thing with uh, you know Cambodia, Laos, all of them. Uh, we we would like to see more economic development there. And you know, I find what you're doing fascinating. Where can people follow you on? Uh, you know, when you're talking about rare earths or any missives that you're putting in writing and putting out there, I just, I'm going to take a wild guess and say you're not much of a Twitter guy. You're right. <laughs> That's Twitter. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's a, it's a pretty divisive, you know, uh, forum for people to anonymously call each other names. Yeah. Well, I guess from my, from my military background, a lot of our information was made public and we got People in our social security numbers are littered around the world and everything else. So I'm, I stay off of public media as much as I possibly can. No Instagram, no Twitter. I don't have a website. I just you just you, you do the well. It makes this makes this conversation that much more important for the listeners. You're not going to get this everywhere else. But we're going to follow you, uh, General Kern. We we kind of know you socially now. So as we understand there are important things to discuss or developments in rare earth. We'd like to be able to talk about it, whether it's with you or one of your colleagues. We, we think it's an ongoing discussion. One of the ways to get these things done is to constantly talk about supply chain and let's not, let's not get comfortable again for a few more cents and send that supply chain back overseas, right? I agree with you. You know, military logistics is interesting. Um, the logisticians are not the guys on the front line or gals, but they have a credo that says, don't let the warfighter down. And so they, they believe in making sure that their supply chain is one that gets to the people who need it. And I think as a nation, we could adopt that. Let's look at all the supply chains that we have and understand where stuff comes from. This thing that we've been floating around with now for the last 20 years that didn't exist before. The phone. Parts of a company. Yeah. Yeah. How does it? How does it? It changed our lives. So we ought to understand it a lot better in terms of what goes into it. Agreed. Any last word for your fellow Americans? Number one, I still believe in America as the greatest country in the world. I think we yes. have lived in a period of perhaps unique times that came out of World War II up into period today, and now we're in a much more competitive world on a more even footing than we were in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. And we have to recognize that, that we're competing 
on a fair basis, and sometimes on a not fair basis with lots of other people out there who aren't stupid. You know, they have capability, they have resources, and, and they want to have a better life for their children as much as we do. So if we recognize the world that we're living in and we believe in America, I think we can all pull this off and maintain another 200 years of, of living well in a world that we created pretty much at peace for the last 50 years. If you're in the military, you may not believe that, but for most Americans, and less than one-tenth of one percent or something ever serve in the military right now, life's been pretty good. So I think the ability that we've created, we need to sustain. Uh, but we do that by everybody pulling together, listening to the different ideas that people have and finding a, a path that's good for everyone. Well, General Kern, thank you for your commitment to the people, to our country, the people first. And thank you for like staying after it, you know, at, after the military. It seems like rather than doing the speaking tour and the lecturing, you're, you're out there identifying critical infrastructure issues and using your talent to this day to help us. And thank you for that as well, General Kern. I hope to see you in person someday next time you're in Pennsylvania. You know, maybe we can, we can sit and talk about how we uh, fight back China. Okay. All right. Look forward thank to you that. very much.